So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's event, uh, where Svante Cornell will present the book, uh, The Long Game uh, on the Silk Road. As you all know, Svante Cornell is the director of one of the directors of the ISTP, Institute of Security and Development Policy. He's also director of the Central Asia Caucus Institute and Silk Road Studies Program Joint Center. It's a lot center, so I have to look at it. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> with us also, we have um, the amb Swedish ambassador to uh, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, uh, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan. Uh, in, um, Ingrid Tashman. She was she has been ambassador to those countries for three years, and uh, but she, before that she was the Swedish ambassador to Moldavia for five years. Um, I will not speak very much more than that, and I will give the word to uh, Dr. Cornell to uh, present his book to us, and then after that, uh, Ambassador Tashman will give some comments. After that, we will open up the floor for your questions and comments. So, please, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, everybody here. This is, I think, a book which, uh, in a way, uh, summarizes some of the observations that we have had over the past two decades. Uh, and I'm the co-author of this book together with Frederick Starr, who is the founding chairman of the Central Asia Autonomous Institute in Washington, with which, of course, our Silver Studies program has a joint center that Professor Maria mentioned. Uh, and throughout this, uh, this period, since the, uh, the Central Asia Conferences Institute was founded in uh, 1997, and the uh, Central Studies program uh, saw the light of day here in Sweden in 2003, and ever since we've been uh, researching a number of areas uh, of politics, um, security, and uh, development issues uh, in this region, uh, but we've also been involved in, so to speak, both on the sidelines, if you will, in observing um, both American and European policy towards this region. And the impetus for this book came after 25 years of independence when we thought it was the time to take stock of what had happened in uh, that quarter century, what has been achieved, where are, is there room for improvement. And I think that this is, this is the, um, the, the aim of the book. So the book acknowledges that there has been a tremendous, uh, uh, there have been tremendous accomplishments of European and American policies towards this region, um, but that there is the spirit of the book is that there is a lot that can be made even better. In fact, as I'll get to in a moment, our general view is that the uh, policies started out very strongly in the 1990s, but have more and more uh, been the subject of disarray. So, first of all, I think an obvious point in the in the book itself is that we view Central Asia and the Caucasus as connected, strategically connected from a Western perspective. Um, obviously, with everything I say here today will be in a kind of staccato version, and you will have to look at the book for, for more detail. But the basic point uh, is that uh, Central Asia's importance is obvious from geography, uh, from being surrounded by the large powers of the Eurasian continent, Russia, China, India, Iran, Turkey, uh, Pakistan. But also, um, because, it, and it represents the first time in, in a very long time that West, the West actually has a presence on the heart of the Eurasian continent. Uh, now, the problem, of course, is that you can't really get to Central Asia very easily unless you have the connection through the Caucasus, particularly from Europe, because surrounding Central Asia you have territory countries that are either hostile to Western interests or, at best, uh, questionable partners. Russia, China, um, India and uh, Iran being the four, Pakistan and Iran being the countries surrounding, surrounding the region. And you can add Turkey to that in the West. And the Caucasus, of course, is therefore important not only as the easternmost part of Eastern Europe, but as in the very corridor that enables the Western presence. Um, let me very quickly say what, what we consider to be the main Western interests in this, in this region. Um, so we we see, to begin with, an interest uh, in developing stable and sovereign states, independent states, not subject to any foreign powers diktats that co cooperate with the West. Uh, we view 
the long-term resolution of the conflicts, particularly in the Caucasus, is a crucial interest. Uh, but also importantly for Central Asia and the Caucasus to be a zone of secular nation states, uh, and for these states to evolve gradually but solidly into self-governing, law-based states free of corruption that responds to the interests of their citizens. That in turn means states that share Euro-Atlantic values in governance, information, and human rights. And finally, for the entire region to function as an unimpeded and reliable transit corridor between the, Euro the EU and Asia that is not under any foreign powers control. Now, uh, in, term, in, in talking about the, the uh, past 27 years now, uh, we kind of divided roughly into three different phases. A first phase, which we termed the phase of discovery of the region uh, from 1991 to 2001. Uh, in which uh, the United States set up the Freedom Support Act as a piece of legislation for this region. The EU conceived a program such as the FOSECA, the Transport Corridor, Europe Caucasus Asia. Uh, implicitly, uh, we also set up our relations in three different baskets that were modified from the Helsinki Final Act, which of course created the CSC, which became the OSC. Uh, and these are uh, roughly about the three areas of security. Um, economics, and democracy and human rights. And over this first decade of relations, our argument is that the relations developed in all three areas in no particular of these three baskets took priority over the others, which is very important. Now, between 2001 and 2008, there was a second period that started with 9-11 and ended with the Georgia war on the financial crisis, in which we see first uh, an intensification of relations in both the security area and in the <coughs> energy field, uh, especially with the uh, Caspian energy resources. Uh, it goes without saying that the war in Afghanistan would have been impossible without the cooperation of both Central Asia and the Caucasus countries. And we see the Georgian Rose Revolution as a landmark event that also brought in a greater European involvement in the whole region, uh, and a European involvement that actually was made possible by the fact that the EU itself changed with the Eastern and Central European countries becoming members who had a stake and an interest in this region which older EU member states did not have to the same extent. On the other hand, I think we see the beginning of losing focus also in this period. Um, uh, at the same time, you have a Russia that is becoming more authoritarian and aggressive. At the same time, the United States developed under the Bush administration the Freedom Agenda, which focused very strongly on the promotion of democracy and human rights. And this led to uh, the, an ideological or normative element mixing with the real politique of the region uh, at the same time that the levels of assistance for the countries in Central Asia and the Caucasus were drastically reduced because money was shifted to places like Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, increasingly, we see uh, Western countries dividing the regional states into so to be good or bad students uh, only on one basis, their perceived performance in the area of democracy and human rights ignoring other factors, and this leads to a deterioration of relations, particularly with Uzbekistan, but also with Azerbaijan and other countries. Now the last period, uh, from 2008 to the present, we kind of term it very simply as disarray, uh, that the, um, but our, uh, the basic argument, I think, is that both the war in Georgia and the financial crisis, because they happened so closely <coughs> together, had profound implications. Uh, the West failed to deter Russia. Nobody expected the U.S. Marines to come and defend Georgia. But the point was that being the closest partner to the United States and to the West in this region did not save Georgia from aggression, and in fact almost invited a Russian aggression on Georgia. That, that the implicit deterrence that people thought was present did not stop. And then, rightly or wrongly, uh, it, it is perceived that the U.S. rewarded Commas, Russia for this with the reset policy that President Obama created. Uh, we see initiatives, especially by the United States, petering out, such as the New South Grove Initiative or the Turkish Armenia Reconciliation Process, neither of which went anywhere. Uh, whereas the EU is appearing as a much more serious actor than it had been before with the creation of the Eastern Partnership and with the strategy for Central Asia uh, that had not existed. Um, at the same time, we see growing Russian and Chinese assertiveness through uh, the Eurasian Union on Russia's part, the Belt and the Road Initiative on Chinese part. Uh, we also see during this period a reduction, a further reduction of interest in, by the um, forces arguing for an economic interest in the region and for a security engagement with the region. 
which basically leads to the uh, to the to the democracy and human rights agenda capturing the gender setting power for Western policy towards the region. And this, uh, while the resources for the support of democracy and human rights remain extremely low in that global perspective, which leads to this policy basically being uh, reduced to one of naming and shaming, uh, which, uh, because of the lack of resources, only has very little, if any, impact on the actual countries. Uh, we've seen in the past few years, from 2015 maybe, this policy almost going to its logical end and being reversed, for example, with the US in 2015 setting up the C5 plus 1 mechanism with, uh, with uh, Central Asia and some more attempts to engage with the countries that have been more or less alienated. Now, uh, that's kind of the story. Uh, about the, the, uh, the book, uh, half of the book, uh, the second half is more about what we view as the, um, an analysis that mixes uh, critiques with suggestions for improvements, in which we actually have, I would say, very bluntly two parts. One is a conceptual part and one is a structural part. Uh, the structural part focuses very heavily on how the US government is organized uh, and where we uh, essentially talk about how there is a complete lack of coordination between US government agencies that are supposed to be advancing policy in different fields. I won't go very much into this today, but it's obviously all in the book. But on the conceptual part, I think there are a number of issues that have been, uh, that have been uh, quite glaring. And number one is the, the primacy of sovereignty. And by that, I mean that we, after a while, took the existence of these countries for granted. They don't take their existence and survival for granted, particularly after the war in Georgia and the Russian invasions of Ukraine. Uh, they live in an environment where they perceive existential threats to their survival, which was, by the way, not only state survival, but very often the personal survival of leaders that take decisions that some of their neighbors might not like. Uh, we have often adopted a policy that doesn't view the security needs of these states as being serious, and we have certainly disengaged rather than engaged with the security issues in this region. The most obvious example is that after Georgia got invaded by Russia, the United States stopped selling uh, weapons to Georgia, which it had been doing until then, which tells you uh, only after the end of the Obama administration did was the decision not to sell lethal weaponry to Georgia and Ukraine reversed, and we're now seeing very limited supplies of weaponry to these countries that enable them to increase their self-defense capabilities. Um, this led to a lot of insecurity in the region and it also led to very convinced Democrats, uh, such as many of the people who took part in the Rose Revolution in Georgia, to start focusing on safeguarding the state. Uh, being seen and perceived, we told them that there was no, no contradiction, but they perceived the contradiction between policies that would make the country more liberal and policies that would safeguard the state against external and transnational, very often, attacks. And when faced with that choice, most of the politicians in this region, whether young or old, Soviet or non-Soviet, opted for safeguarding the state when it happened. Um, and our argument is that until we take the security issues seriously, this will continue to be the case. Another point is the issue of Western assistance and what merits Western assistance. Here, um, to put it a little bluntly, we see a tendency for assistance to be understood not as an investment, but as a reward for good students. Uh, so the EU has very explicitly the more for more policy, which means that the more you, the better you are at reforming, the more we will we support you for reforming. But that may obscure the fact that the countries that may need the most reform actually then end up receiving less in terms of support. Uh, it may be more difficult to engage in reforms there, it doesn't make it less necessary. And similarly, we see in the US policy an embrace of Kyrgyzstan in spite of the kicking out with the United States from the Manas Airways, for example, but because Kyrgyzstan was supposed to be the island of democracy in Central Asia, which of course in many ways it was not, uh, assistance continued, uh, although it seemed, it seemed to be the only criteria by which it was judged that a country was uh, should receive assistance or not. Uh, so in other hand, our argument is, is that Western assistance should not be a reward for approaching a finish line in a quote-unquote race toward democracy, but as an investment in countries that are important to a range of our interests, whether they be in the normative field, in the security area, or in economic and trade issues. Um, 
what we see also in the in the promotion of democracy and human rights, which is a goal that we wholeheartedly agree with. However, we feel that the way that this has been promoted has very often left much to be desired. In particular, um, we think that Western countries at the beginning of independence did one major conceptual mistake, which was to underestimate the effect of the Soviet legacy. The countries that had not been part of the Soviet Union in Central and Eastern Europe were able to transition to more or less functioning democracies and market economies relatively fast. We have seen backlashes in the, very close to here, as we all know, within the EU boundaries, actually. But still, there was a very clear distinction between the countries that were part of the Soviet Union and those that were not. And we did not see that. We did not understand fully uh, that in a situation where the entire state bureaucracy is completely corrupt and deficient, it is very difficult to build democracy, especially if you don't focus on reforming institutions and instead focus only or predominantly on building up civil society and on elections. And that has not been solved the problem. In fact, um, you can only quote uh, President uh, Ashraf Ghani of Afghanistan, who has explicitly criticized Western powers for channeling all their funds to the NGOs because that means that all the talent in society gets shifted from the state over to the NGOs and empties the state of talent and capabilities uh, and makes it very difficult for state institutions to be reformed. So in a sense, uh, we, uh, we identify a tendency to treat democracy as we call it as an independent variable, something that is completely independent of any prerequisites that may be built. Uh, in other words, uh, that for a country to be able to move towards democracy, there has to be functioning governments. And very often we have tried to build the second story of the house, which is uh, a liberal democracy, without building the first floor, which is a functioning state with uh, functioning governments. Uh, and we cite scholarship here, for example, Latin America specialist Marilyn Marilyn Grindle, who has a book that focuses on the concept of good enough government, which it used to include security, the provision of basic services. Uh, without which democracy uh, is not realistic. And similarly, Stephen Krasner of Harvard argues both the endorsement, says that the endorsement of political elites for reform is a precondition for their success. In other words, if the local elites are not invested in, the, in reforms, it is extremely difficult to achieve reforms. Uh, so there's a need to fo focus on objectives uh, that um, where our normative interests are aligned with the interests of the not in which we are pursuing goals that are antagonistic to the interest of the elites. Because in the 1990s, when the West was strong and these countries were very weak, maybe it was possible to force them to enact certain reforms against their will. But now we've reduced the amount of money uh, and of our assistance, uh, we have increased the ambition level of our assistance, and these countries' security services are much stronger, which means they can swat away a fly like a fly some of the some of the initiatives that they don't like, which they couldn't do. And I think the experience of both Georgia and the Rosa Revolution in Uzbekistan in the past two years shows that when you have the endorsement by the state leadership of reform, things can happen very quickly, but only if they are invested in these. And I think the EU has been much better than the United States at that integrating this. So the basic conclusion, I think, is that for uh, our goals in the pursuit of support of democracy and human rights to be successful, it is perhaps counterintuitively necessary to work with governments, not against governments. Uh, and that means that we have to rely less on, on, on NGOs for, for fulfilling and implementing our policies and work more directly with state institutions to build good governance. Um, another conceptual issue which is uh, very crucial but overlooked very often is the issue of secular governance. Uh, Western policies have more or less ignored the value of six uh, secular Muslim-majority countries seeing the light of day in 1990. <coughs> Even worse, very often, the, the fact that these countries are trying to maintain secular forms of government, secular laws, and secular education has become criticized for being authoritarian or quote-unquote repressive. Uh, now, th there is no denial that these countries very often uh, uh, adopt very restrictive and heavy-handed tools to implement these policies. But that doesn't change the fact that there is a value in, especially when we see what the result has been in the larger Muslim world of the mixing of politics and religion, uh, that there is a model being developed, a secular statehood, that maintains uh, such a simple thing as an educational system based on reason and not on divine revelation. 
Uh, and I think this is crucial going forward. And there is a, certainly a possibility that in 10 or 20 years, there is going to be a Central Asian model uh, of state religion interaction in the Muslim world that other countries will take an interest in after the wars and religion that are currently going on in the Middle East will have uh, gone further. Um, so, in order to make that happen, I think it's, impo it's important to appreciate what these states are trying to do and therefore help them find better ways to achieve those goals uh, rather than simply wholesale rejecting what they're trying to do. Finally, on, in the conceptual part, uh, the regional aspect of things is very important. Now, these countries are all very different. If you look only at the Caucasus, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia are completely different countries not only in terms of geopolitical orientation, but in terms of the languages they speak uh, and the alphabets they use. But still, uh, we view the both American and European interests in this region as being regional. There is no <coughs> extremely strong bilateral European or American interest in Tajikistan or in uh, Armenia or in any of the other countries. The very rationale behind the, behind the interest that we have in these countries is what I talked about initially today, which is that, that the sum of the whole of these countries makes them very important to, on a global level to Western interests. Now, in the past, uh, in the, especially in the 1990s, there was an understanding in Western policy about the regional nature of our interests, but this has disappeared. And over time, two things have happened. Increasingly, we have ascended into more or less bilateral relations with these countries without really having a regional vision for what we're trying to achieve. And secondly, we have a split between the Caucasus and Central Asia, which has been in some ways normal and natural, with the bureaucratic divisions that have put uh, the Caucasus into the European bloc of countries, and, South a and Central Asia has, certainly in the United States, been joined with South Asia. Uh, and that means that the connection across the Caspian has disappeared completely, which was very much a part of Western policy in the 1990s. Uh, and this may have been uh, uh, acceptable, if you will, when the Caspian issue was just, you know, a part of Western of oil being transited from the Caspian to the West, but now that we're seeing the development of uh, regional transportation networks cut across both Central Asia and the Caucasus, we can no longer afford to see them separate. Now, finally, on structural issues, I talked about the coordination of interests, and the, and this is where the bureaucratic stone piping comes in, uh, which is that uh, that we have to be much more uh, um, effective at viewing, uh, connecting our bureaucratic entities that are working on different parts of this region, which by the way includes how Central Asia and Afghanistan are in different bureaus, uh, for example in the EU or in the World Bank or elsewhere, and therefore you see almost no cooperation in these organizations across these regional boundaries, which we have drawn on our maps. But in the region itself, as the Tashkent conference, which I believe you, you attended ambassador in, in, uh, in March on Afghanistan indicates, in Central Asia itself, the distinction between Afghanistan and Central Asia is rapidly disappearing and Afghanistan is being seen as a part of Central Asia. And similarly, the connection between the, the Caucasus and Central Asia is very real. And the Chinese view it, why should we not understand? Um, let me, in the interest of time, move uh, to the, toward the end and say that uh, the, um, the aim of this book and of our uh, analysis is not to so to speak, uh, hand out poses for good works or administer scoldings to those that we have found deficient. Uh, it's not at all an attempt to, to issue some kind of report card, but the purpose is to, uh, to identify areas in which practical improvements may actually be very not only possible uh, but feasible, uh, and that could lead to the fulfillment of the potential that we believe is very real in, the, in Western policy towards Central Asia uh, and the Now, the final a conclusion, I think, is that there are uh, there is no inherent contradiction between the interests either of Western powers, the governments of Central Asia and the Caucasus, or the people who live in those countries. In the long term, and if we align our priorities, I think there is a great uh, potential for cooperation. These are countries that, by their nature, because they're small and middle-sized countries, are interested in, shall we say, geopolitical multipolarity. <laughs> They're interested in attracting outside powers, which includes the West, certainly the United States, certainly Europe, into their uh, chessboard, if you will. Uh, 
And exactly because they're small and medium-sized countries, uh, it's not a coincidence that the larger countries of the region, whether it be Turkey, whether it be Iran, uh, Pakistan, China, or Russia, are less positively predisposed towards the West than the smaller countries. So we have, an, we have a tendency very often to think it's easier to deal with the big countries and the big issues uh, rather than what we should do, which is to focus on the natural affinity we have with, with small countries in this world <coughs> with uh, Western interests. Let me stop here and hand you the... Well, I just do like this and hand over to <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you, Ambassador Valu, and uh, thank you so much, Dr. Connell. It's a pleasure to be here with my good friend. We meet quite often to discuss the developments in Central Asia and the campuses. And it's always rewarding, so it was a pleasure to dive into the book over over the weekend, and also, of course, uh, with uh, Dr. Starr, who is always a brilliant, brilliant writer. Uh, I, I think this is a very good book, and I would recommend those who are interested in the region and its history to, to read it, uh, because I think you have brought up many, many valid points. And I agree with a lot of the analysis uh, that you have done. Uh, I think it's also a useful reading for policymakers in Washington, in Brussels, and in European capitals, uh, and especially at this juncture in time when so much is changing in Central Asia, because I would postulate that Central, the status quo in Central Asia has been changed with the, uh, with the power shift in, in Uzbekistan, and what we are seeing now is unprecedented on many levels. I have said to, to many over the last year or so that as a diplomat, it's very seldom in your career that you can witness something uh, like we are now witnessing in to Uzbekistan, and it is worthy of, of all our support. Uh, so I think that the book, uh, with the lessons learned, uh, has a lot of food for thought for the future for all of us who have an interest and a stake in the, in the region. Um, and I, I do agree with your transition paradigm. I think it's pretty natural that it, uh, that it developed the way it did, because uh, you said that we imposed or our thinking was actually a copy of what we use when we worked with Central Europe and with the countries in the early 90s. But of course, there are, as you so amply pointed out, uh, very, very different countries and, and regions. And the history of being part of the Soviet Union is, of course, a deep, deep imprint. I think there are a couple of reasons why it was so. I think one, because it was perhaps convenient for policymakers. Two, I think there was a lack of knowledge, uh, of, especially of Central Asia, because Central Asia had been part of the Soviet Union. If you worked in, uh, in policy circles, you dealt with the Soviet Union with Moscow, and the embassies were in Moscow, and they were centered in that way. So those who knew Central Asia, I think they knew it mainly from Moscow's eyes, and then it was difficult to make that shift and to look deeper into, into, the, into the countries themselves, and their tremendous and fantastic and rich history. So I think there was a lack of knowledge. Um, and I think also, I mean, it's only recently that we had your Embassies in Central Asia, and if you look at the country by country, they are quite few. Tajikistan, we have three European embassies, the, the Brits, who are not a part of the EU, so the French and the Germans, that is that. Of course, we have EU representation, but the presence that we have is, is, is not so, so, not so, not so much. Because I would like to ask the question is this knowledge of this remarkable region much better today? And I think there is much we can do in our European countries uh, to strengthen that. Um, and I think we you know, some of us know how few people in the bureaucracies work on Central Asia. Uh, and that's not so large either. And I think when this region is then reaching up to its true potential, which I hope and trust will come, then I think we will need to also look at how we do research and what we do. Um, you so clearly point out good governance and functioning, the functioning institutions as the basis for creating uh, sustainable growth and development, and also, of course, for attracting FDI, foreign direct investment. And that is, of course, true for any, any country. But what you really need for that is countries and governments that want to develop those institutions, and countries that want to have governments that serve their citizens, and also countries and governments that are willing and able to take the cost of transition, because if you would change from a corrupt, uh, old legacy like the countries are there with them, someone has to pay the price for more democracy or for more accountability. And of course, if you look at the countries of Central Asia and the Caucasus, that, that will is not always there. And we may want it from the West and from the EU or from countries as donors, 
But in my view, the countries themselves need to want to know what we do, because it's their countries. They want to, they need to be, uh, be the ones who are driving the, the change and driving the transition, then we can assist. But it will have to be their country and their, and their uh, process. Uh, but of course, I think they, it's very good to bring up the security prerogative the way you do, that the way you do in the book, and how they have been fighting for the sovereignty of the countries, uh, and that has not been enough acknowledged in the, in the West, uh, I believe. I, I attended a conference in Turkmenistan in December 2015. It was the uh, neutrality conference, one of the many that is hosted in Turkmenistan. And at the conference was all leaders, all presidents of uh, the former Soviet, uh, of the former Soviet, Soviet, Soviet Union, including Mr. Karimov. And Mr. Karimov at that time, he held a very firing speech uh, on what they actually had inherited from the Soviet Union, which is actually not much. So how they had to fight all the countries for themselves, for sovereignty, for security, and to build a state with actually nothing, and to kind of recreate a state that they had never had. And that speech was then in certain ways echoed by some of the other, other speakers. Um, and if you go back at what they had when the Soviet Union fell apart, they did not have much. The Baltic countries did not have it either, but the, the Central Asian countries did definitely not have it. Uh, and I also uh, agree with you on working with governments, uh, provided that the governments want that change. You have to have a partner. Uh, you cannot change or transition working only with a certain part of society. Those that can need to change is the legislators, is parliaments, to the, to, the, to the extent that parliaments have that power. But of course, governments and, and policy policy makers, uh, and that you cannot work around with. with. Um, I think also that a lot has been done in creating sustainable institutions and supporting good governance. And I think if we look throughout these countries, we see many good examples. I think and perhaps the most of them are in Kazakhstan, uh, where there has been a lot of support to the justice sector, also with the EU and with the clear will from, from the country in question to, to build up uh, uh, an independent and functional justice sector. So I think we can we can point to many good examples that when the will is there and the support is there, a lot can be can be done. You also mentioned in your book two remarkable examples and that is the justice houses in Georgia and the Assange centers in Azerbaijan. Uh, two institutions or two bodies in, in respect in respective countries that are working to serve the citizens which have been uh, created from within the countries themselves because the governments have said that they needed to support and to work with the citizens, no donors involved. So it's about the political will again that when the will is there, uh, you can do you can do a lot. And I think this change, this transition, whatever it would be, uh, will have an interaction between governments, uh, between the will and also where civil society has space. Uh, and I think your analysis of this is, is very is very valuable. I think you've devoted quite a bit of, of space in your, in your book on, on civil society and you're also quite critical, as you've mentioned here, on how Western governments have been working with civil society. And I, I do not know if it was an either or choice that Western donors made it all the time, or if it was seen as being more, we thought that it was more close to us to work with uh, civil society, what we thought was. Uh, but I think we all know that it takes decades or hundreds of years to build up a civil society. That's what we have done in our country. I think we have to go back a few hundred years to see where, where it started. So thinking that they can be done in 25 years or 27 years in Central Asia, I think that is to be a little bit too optimistic. Um, but I would also say that for us as the European Union, uh, I think a civil society is much needed also in, also in Central Asia. Uh, because I think that would functioning civil society to the extent that it is wanted by the citizens themselves mainly will have a good contribution to the country's development. Or perhaps one can argue in certain cases and maybe that is what you do, that we are exporting something that may not have always been wanted in certain countries. But I think the reason we want it and the reason why the countries of Central Asia should want it is that civil society has created resilient societies and also democratic governance is needed, uh, is needed for, for direct investment and responsible FDI is also much needed in, uh, in Central Asia. And I think if I look to look at the context and the meetings and what I, that I have had over the last couple of years in Central Asia, I think this is coming a little bit more to the fore. And I think the support that has been provided to civil society uh, 
it's actually going to prove over time to be a good investment for the countries themselves, most of, most of all. And I've seen a few conferences, and I know that you, Dr. Kunel, has done it too, where you've seen a very active and vibrant uh, Central Asian civil society criticizing us as donors, the European Union, coming with good suggestions on what we can do differently over, over time. So I hope that if we look to the future, that we'll have even a good investment also in civil society. And I think it will strengthen their countries. Um, coordination. Policy coordination is a fantastic word. Uh, you devote a fantastic chapter to coordination between the EU and the United States and, and NATO. And I think those of us who work in government, we want policy coordination all the time within our departments, uh, within between our ministries, with civil society, with other governments, and it is a perennial. Um, I would postulate that when we look at Central Asia, um, that we are quite united. Uh, United States, Europe, and NATO, on what the goals are, what the overall goals are. Goals are. And the goals are sovereignty, uh, stability, uh, democracy to the extent that will come over time. And of course, uh, I'll come back to that. And I think the most important is that we uh, are united in that overall goal. Oh, but I think we should be quite careful in looking at coordination, need for coordination on, uh, on, a, on a lower level. Because I think all the countries will work in different ways with uh, donor assistance, with development assistance. And uh, perhaps within the EU, we could be a little bit better at coordinating as of 27 or 2028 and how we develop our programs. We could be more flexible, we could listen more, we could be faster. And I hope that that will come in the, in the, in the future. Um, but I, another part of the coordination is not what we coordinate toward them. The most important is how the the recipient countries coordinate with us. And this is, I believe, a traditional uh, issue for everyone who's been working with development co co uh, cooperation. We can coordinate as much as we want, but if it's not coordinated in the capital, within the government, between the ministries, our coordination will not help. And this is, of course, a great challenge in every country that is a recipient of, of support. Now, if I look at the, uh, the countries that your book is covering, and I was looking, where could I possibly find a decent of coordination, I was thinking maybe Georgia. Uh, and maybe Georgia over time, um, I'm not sure about today, maybe you know no more. And I think the ability to, to coordinate varies over time with the strength of the institutions, with the government that's in power at a certain point in time, and also sometimes actually your persons. If you have a very strong EU ambassador or a strong UDP person, or you have a strong leader in one of the prime ministers in the prime minister's office and sees the need for this, you will immediately get better coordination, and that will, of course, be able to deliver services to, do, to the uh, citizens. So it depends on commitment and political will in the end. And once again, I think the recipient country will need to want that more than we do as a donor. That was something I often said in interviews in one certain where global coordination was not strong. You have to want this reforms more than we do. We can support, but it is your country, it is your future, it is your reforms. You have the last paragraph in your book is about patience. And I like that because 27 years is a very short time for anyone. I have a daughter who's 25 and she is not an adult, and I cannot imagine that a uh, Sorry for that. <laughs> but you are a young person and you are still shapeable. In a country that is 27 years old, no matter that they have eons of history behind them, uh, is perhaps not also an adult in, in that sense. And I think to give strategic patience to countries that are really working on creating a better you know, future for themselves is something that we need to become better at because we do not have it, as you point out. We are in a hurry, our parliaments are in a hurry, our governments are in a hurry. They change. Uh, we as policy you know, supporters, we want to deliver something good and to show that we have you know, been contributing to something. But I think in, in this part of the world, I think it's really, really important to look at this with a very, very long-term perspective and to be pleased for the small steps of, uh, of change, of positive change. So maybe we should think of strategic visions uh, when it comes to, to Central Asia. And also, as you so aptly point out, uh, to really acknowledge the advances that the countries have made over the last 27 years because they are great. I wanted to say a few words about the European Union and Central Asia today, where we are and where we want to head. 
and about the new uh, EU strategy that's being developed. Um, first, I would like to say that we do have clear interests and we do have clear principles. Our interests are peace, long-time stability and prosperity, because the same countries of Central Asia are the neighbors of our eastern neighbors. There are risks in this region, if you want to call it a region. Uh, they belong in this big area of radicalization, which you also devote a part to this very complex, uh, complex uh, issue, and terrorism. Central Asia is a major source of energy and raw material, which of course the European Union is interested in and is supporting. And we are not the EU, it's the first time that we are Kazakhstan when it comes to Kazakhstan's energy exports. The young population is growing very fast. I think about 50% of the population in Uzbekistan is under 26, and the country's population is uh, 32 million. And Uzbekistan needs to create about 600,000 new jobs every year to keep people at work. That's a challenge which is tremendous, I have to say. And of course, as you pointed out, Central Asia is indispensable regarding connectivity, and that will really increase over, over time. Um, if we compare today to when your book took its departure point, I think there is a quite a, there's a strong interest in Central Asia within the European Union, and maybe that has grown also in the last five years. Um, the changes in, in Uzbekistan and the new reform path and the speed with which that goes uh, has of course changed the EU's engagement and, and the interest, I would say. Uh, you can look at uh, the Samarkand conference in November when Uzbekistan really, together with its neighbors, took a stance and a step into the international arena. Uh, the Afghanistan conference that you mentioned in Tashkent uh, in, in March. Um, Mr. Mogherini attended both of those uh, with colleagues at high level from the European Union. I think that would not have happened in any of the big conferences that we have seen in the Central Asia over the last five or six years. And I think that has also been recognized by the Central Asian states. And the EU wants to be a partner for, step for sustainable development and also for modernization. And we say that very clearly to our Central Asian colleagues, and I believe that is much more appreciated. I hear that Central Asia wants more of the EU, not less. Civil society in Central Asia wants, uh, as was told in Almaty a few weeks ago at a conference, the good life of citizens that the EU offers its own. And of course they also want a good dialogue with us, and that is being provided by the European Union, uh, which I think is very positive also. We have many formats for, um, for, these, uh, for the consultations and contacts with Central Asia. Ministerial meetings. Uh, we have consultations within the partnership and cooperation agreements, which are quite quite formal, goes over a broad range of, of, of the agenda. We hold human rights dialogues. Uh, the high level and security policy dialogue is uh, held annually. We have a, uh, I would say, a very active um, uh, special representative, uh, Mr. Peter Guria, who is a very good interlocutor for Central Asia and has access to the highest level and can really convey the policies to. Uh, you know, and we have active EU delegations uh, in most Central Asian states. And I, I would say that our instruments are, are getting better over time because we understand more, and by that you can develop better instruments. And I think we are, as the European, um, European Union, we are a good supplier of norms and standards uh, to the countries of Central Asia. We can be a source of inspiration. We, can, we are also defenders of intellectual intellectual property rights. Uh, I know that China quite aggressively promotes their standards, their standards are not global, and I believe that we are founding members of all standardization bodies, and our standards are global, and that will serve country, the countries in Central Asia when they want to go global, as I know at least a number of them want to, want to do now. Uh, we also need human rights. I touched upon that before, because we need the resilient societies. And we need our companies that would like to invest, those that are there and those who are now interested in, at least in Uzbekistan, they need democratic governments, governments to be able to uh, trust that their investments and their business dealings in Central Asia will be forward. And I would say that Central Asia suffered a, uh, suffers a lack of good FDI, um, and we can offer that from the European Union. And the EU is very good at business climate development, and some of our institutions, the EBRD, the EIB, uh, also some of our programs are working on that. 
Rambo's regional cooperation, that is the DNA of the European Union. And we can share our experience uh, from, from Europe. And I know that that is now being asked for in Central Asia in a way that it was not before. I think we have a strong value added there. Um, we have, of course, connectivity, an issue which is often today connected with Central Asia and uh, being on the transit line between China and Europe. And I trust this is very positive to strengthen connectivity, even though China uh, is doing what it can uh, to do that. I think it will benefit all countries of Central Asia and also, uh, also us. So I don't think that China can fulfill all the needs of all the region. When EIB and the EBR, the EMB instruments that we as the European Union uh, use, we have a different approach to connectivity. We have a strong component of sustainability, fiscal, environmental, and social. And I think that is wanted and needed more and more by, by the Central Asian countries. And the last word on uh, the new European Union strategy for Central Asia, um, going back to coordination and the need for coordination. Uh, in 2019, there will be a new uh, seven years, seven year old, seven year strategy uh, of EU support and cooperation with Central Asia. And it's now being prepared by the European Action Service and by DEVCO, the Commission. And there is a very thorough consultation process going on with the governments of Central Asia, with a very active civil society uh, in Central Asia, with EU member states, and with Afghanistan. Now the EU is seeing that we need to work with Afghanistan and look at Central Asia, uh, where Afghanistan is actually a part. The EU is also working on uh, creating a connectivity strategy, uh, and there will be a link between the Central Asia strategy and the connectivity strategy. And I think this consultation process is quite unprecedented for the European Union, and I have not seen it before in my 25 years in, in uh, working for the, for the foreign Industry and also where the European Union is extraordinarily open to all of us and to uh, actors in the region to say, please come to us with the ideas, tell us what did not work, what works, what shall we do, what shall we definitely not do. And the issues that are discussed, uh, which will one way or the other be part of, of the new cooperation with Central Asia, is regional cooperation, good governance, of course, economic development, job creation, private sector growth, which is key the young people in, in the region, education, and of course, connectivity. Um, I think I will stop there, and then maybe we can have a discussion going to the changes of this status quo in Central Asia, what that may mean for, for the region, for Afghanistan, for us, and as you said, the growing importance of Central Asia, because I believe it's going to be much more central again as it once was a few hundred years ago, and not much of knowledge and science and poetry came from Central Asia. So, and we should then be good partners and support the change. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you so much. <coughs> we now have time for um, questions and comments. So, I leave the floor open. Please raise your hand, and uh, I'd also ask you to uh, present yourself. Uh, if you don't want to, that's okay, but please. <laughs> Go ahead. One, one question here in the front. Okay, so my name is oh. Hi. Uh, my name is uh, Sophia Topaze. I am originally from uh, Georgia, but I live uh, now in Sweden for some time. Um, I have uh, questions actually to both of you. I don't to take all the time. But, um, one question I just came back from Uzbekistan a couple of uh, days ago, so uh, it's really. Um, uh, it's, it's really noticeable how, like, since the first person you meet at the airport, everyone is trying to convey this message of change. Uh, and, uh, and my question is, uh, is uh, there any sort of a vision towards uh, what these changes are going towards in Uzbekistan, or are these some sort of uh, spontaneous uh, reforms? What do you think? And the second the question I had uh, was about um, regional uh, policy and sort of uh, all of these uh, countries have uh, developed in such uh, different ways after the 90s. That is it uh, useful to have this sort of regional uh, policy towards them, or maybe this bilateral relationships works a bit more? Because sometimes, especially from a Georgian perspective, it seems that uh, it's more playing the Russia's game, sort of 
keeping this region as a Russian sphere of influence with this use of CIS all the time and so on. So what do you think about that? Thank you. The last one. Yes, there is a vision and uh, yes, there is a plan. And the best way to see that is to search on the net for the, uh, the five-year development strategy of Uzbekistan that was adopted in January 2017. It's a multi-page document that uh, really goes through area for area what the president and his team, what, what the vision is for the country. And if you read that, you get uh, amazed and impressed because this is, in a sense, turning I would say the relationship between the state and the citizens around where the citizens are put in the center and where the institutions and the state are supposed to serve them. Uh, and that goes through area by area, justice, uh, media, human rights, uh, area by area. And I think and since that plan was adopted, that is what the ministries and the agencies are working at and also in very good cooperation with international organizations, uh, not least the UN bodies that are there, and embassies and, and IFIs. Uh, the, the pace is fast, the vision is there, and when I was there just a few weeks ago, I came out and the, this, there's no going back. And I think that is remarkable for any country, anywhere, and especially for a country that has been so close to for so many years, even though that is not going to be so long as time for the years. If I may, I can just uh, add to that that we um, there may be outside a few examples of a uh, few papers we published um, we published uh, in the past few months uh, some court papers on the uh, new foreign policy of Uzbekistan, on economic modernization, on judicial reform, as well as on political reform and uh, electoral reform. And all of this will come together in a book which is in press right now with the title of Uzbekistan's New Face. Uh, but most of the papers, as I said, are already online, and, and I think the uh, I think the, the question is exactly as you pointed out. There is definitely a vision. Uh, the question is whether the avalanche of initiatives, uh, reforms, uh, policies, strategies that come out of the government and of the, the presidential office can be digested by the bureaucracy at this point. Uh, that's, uh, so we, we wish them well, but what you can see very clearly is that the uh, the, uh, the sense by the leadership, which I think is correct, and I think the experience of Georgia after 2004 showed it, that you only have a certain amount of um, momentum at which you can you can push forward with these thorough reforms. And once you slow down, you're not going to be able to find that speed. On the other hand, uh, there is only so much that it is a bureaucracy was quite isolated for many, many years, uh, even from a very long starting point of independence, uh, what they can actually achieve. The human capital, Uzbekistan is a great human capital, but the ability to still absorbing all of these reforms, implementing things, making, turning these things into reality is not new. They're, they're going to need a lot of help. They want help, and I think the interesting part, going back to what you said, is that we see now in the past uh, several years, particularly after the oil price dropped three or four years ago, uh, everywhere in the region there is a thirst for reform. Leaderships that have been taking it quite easy, you know, when oil prices were high, they could afford it, you know. Uh, they suddenly realize that they now have to engage in serious economic and political reform to maintain the legitimacy of the state and, and the leadership. Uh, Kazakhstan was the first to engage in a barrage of reform initiatives, and Uzbekistan followed. Where do they look for when they they want to implement these reforms? They don't look to China, they don't look to Russia, they don't look to Iran, they don't look to Turkey. They look to the West, they look to Europe primarily, and to some extent to North America. And I think that is has very much affected the balance in the relationship. On your question on regionalism, um, the point is taken that these countries are very different. Um, and I think there is no real contradiction between our thinking and our strategy being regional and the implementation being bilateral. Um, so obviously the main way through which we interact with other countries is bilateral. But the point is that if we allow, I think somewhere in the book we, we mentioned that the a little detail about Central Asia and the Caucasus, if you want to take on the political scientific perspective, is that it's a region which only extremely rarely 
comes up to the level of the highest political decision makers. Mm -hmm. uh, the only U.S. presidential visit was to Georgia in 2005 by President Bush. Even if you take it at the level of cabinet ministers that have an in, that, with very few exceptions, Donald Rumsfeld perhaps being one, there are others that have to take a personal interest or a professional interest or have to, as Rumsfeld did because of cancer. Otherwise, there may be a certain delegation or a certain trip when a cabinet ministry level person takes an interest in the region and then that interest fades. Which means that this is a case study of what happens if you allow the bureaucracy to run foreign policy. Uh, and, and that is what we mean by the fact that there needs to be a regional vision. If you allow the relationship only to be run by the bilateral exchanges of non-verbals, if you will, uh, that's not going to lead to anything. And at the end of the day, it's also going to mean that it's going to be extremely difficult to gather attention in your society by your companies, by your government, for X country X, unless there is a regional understanding of why we're doing this. Why are we investing? Why are we investing in a hydroelectric power plant in Kyrgyzstan, for example? Whatever it is you do, there has to be a regional thinking of why does this matter to us? And here, you know. That's also one of the reasons why we say that the, the fact that the democracy promotion has captured the agenda setting ability for the region has been done uh, Because the altruistic idea of we're going to make the world better by making other countries as democratic as we are, that is not strong enough to drive a policy in countries that are so far away from here. Uh, and certainly not, as we've seen, we're not willing to even invest the requisite funds to do that. So there has to be a broader idea of why are we here, what is our interest in this region, which cannot be either security or economics or the promotion of democracy. It has to be a broader vision of why the region matters and why all of these things have to be part of it. Then obviously we need to implement all of this by background. But the thinking behind it has to be regional because we're never ourselves going to be able to develop serious policies if it's only going to be towards one. Maybe it will, like in, in Georgia it happened in 2004, there was a development of policy for Georgia specific. After that, we saw that as soon as this idea of Georgia as the island, as the, not the current time, the island of democracy, Georgia was the beacon of democracy, but as soon as that faded away somehow, um, there was this array again. And you find that people are not interested as they were 10 years ago in, in the issue of Georgia. So there has to be a much broader narrative than Thank you. Uh, yes, please, go ahead. Um, hello, my name is Morris. Uh, I'm currently a student of the political economy at Stockholm University. Uh, I come from Afghanistan. Um, one of the main issues in Afghanistan for over decades now is security. And during the Taliban regime, not only the people of Afghanistan felt unsafe, but the people in the whole region and later in the whole world. Uh, the 9 11 Arabic incident by the Al Qaeda, uh, the leader of Al Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, fled to Afghanistan and used Afghanistan as a safe haven for his operations. And since then, uh, the militancy in that region grew. Among, uh, among many other militant groups, the Uzbekistan, Islamic movement of Uzbekistan fled their allegiance to Al Qaeda and Taliban, and now the works of all to ISIS. So, given these current security challenges and problems, how can we move towards prosperous and peaceful Central Asia? Because peace in Central Asia means peace in Europe and peace in the rest of the world. Thank you. Say the least, a very important question. <laughs> 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 Quickly. Any, any of you? Well, I can take a first step. I think um, there, this is also where the our, our, our our perspectives on Central Asia are, are diverged sometimes because it's very easy to take static pictures of things. Uh, you know, people who understood what was going on in Uzbekistan from things in 2003 or 4 or 5, today it's a very different country. As I said, I actually was, but we have a whole chapter in the book that talks about what has happened in Central Asia and the caucuses over the past 25 years. And then we, we track, in, if you will, the, the very difficult beginnings of all of these things, uh, and how Westerners underestimated the difficulties of living states, but also show that it, in many ways the class is not only half full, it's much more than half full. We really see, uh, and until these reforms in Uzbekistan, to some extent even before that, Kazakhstan had begun to attract some of the attention, certainly from the private sector. 
the Central Asia as a whole was viewed as this area of darkness. There was nothing happening, it was just authoritarian and repressive, and it was bad, and it was corrupt, and there were terrorists, and there was this and there was that. Uh, but the real, there is a completely different story of Central Asia, which is that there have been really coming into existence of real states. Uh, that have consolidated as real nations for the most part. Yes, there are still issues uh, uh, in many places, but overall, what were just states on paper in 1991 and then become real countries. They were not real countries, let's be frank, 25 years ago. And that's why some of their presidents were acutely aware of these dangers, and that's why they adopted some defensive and restrictive policies. Um, so Central Asian countries, in particular Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, have now taken an interest in helping assistance for the for provision of security and uh, economic development to Afghanistan. And I think that is just one example of how Central Asia, so to speak, is emerging on the world stage. Kazakhstan was the first to do this because Kazakhstan adopted a very active diplomatic uh, profile uh, over a decade ago. And as you know, I mean, there are Astana talks in Syria taking place in Kazakhstan, the Uranium Bank World, world Uranium Bank is in, is in Kazakhstan. There are many different diplomatic initiatives. So, now we're seeing Uzbekistan step up to the scene in a similar way. And the fact that these two countries are taking this proactive approach, and very much in coordination with each other, by the way. One important thing that happened in March of this year uh, is not only that there was a conference in Afghanistan and such things, but there was a meeting of all five regional Central Asian leaders, uh, which hadn't happened for over a decade. Um, the Central Asians, by the way, did create in the late 1990s mechanism for meeting regularly, but Mr. Putin found this to be so interesting that he joined it and then abolished it, and forced him to, to join in with the uh, Russia-led uh, coordination and cooperation mechanisms. There was nothing where Central Asian leaders were able to meet by their own. What they did now in March it was an Uzbek initiative, but it took place in Kazakhstan. And that shows you how uh, the region is really taking charge of itself, and I think when President Mirziyoyev and Nazarbayev met, one of them said that you know we have great respect for China and Russia, they are our big neighbors, they are our eternal neighbors, or something like that. But Central Asia will not take care of the regional matters themselves. And this is something which is very important. And this is what provides a, a lot of uh, hope, I think, even from the perspective of Afghanistan, where obviously the, the, the difficulties are, are very high, but especially given the difficulties in Pakistan for Afghanistan. The opening of the, of the northern Order from an economic perspective, could have a lot of implications. I have uh, nothing to, to add, really, and I agree with uh, what Dr. Connell said. Uh, and I think this the this sea change where the Central Asian countries are seeing Afghanistan not only as a threat but as an opportunity and are willing to work together uh, for that opportunity for that opportunity to materialize, I think is a tremendous change for for this, this part of this part of the world. I mean, your country, you know that, as I've served in Afghanistan for one year, so I know a tiny sliver of, of your beautiful country, but I think you know much more what's needed domestically for, for that to, to come about. But I think when you have the engagement of your neighbors, when your neighbors see you as an opportunity that where we can work together for the benefit of all our peoples, because if the people of Afghanistan, with all your ethnic mixes, will uh, be able to uh, see lights in the tunnel and so many Maybe one more thing that is supposed the, uh, the connectivity projects that I know that the regions, the Central Asia State leaders, see as opportunities of taking the Tapi, Casa 1000, and to the railway uh, and transportation links that are now being established. That is also being part of the mission from the Central Asia leaders uh, to work with Afghanistan. Uh, and and we can, we, there's so much to follow on what happens on the infrastructure issue. Maybe that's a tiny bit of the puzzle to be sustainability, but the conflicts itself, themselves, that's an issue. But you have the support of your neighbors in a much clearer way than you did not have before, and that is worth it. Uh, yes, please. Okay. And then uh, we can take two questions uh, at the same time. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Victoria Thomas. Currently off duty from the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, thank you for the very interesting presentation. Um, I'm glad to hear that we have this very positive uh, development. I have two questions, uh, quite different. 
The first one is uh, talking about the positive development. To what extent does this include fighting corruption? Uh, you have t touched upon the subject, but as you all know, this has been a tremendous problem, not least as an inheritance from, inheritance from the Soviet area. era. Uh, and then also I would like to hear you have uh, spoken about an increased regional co co cooperation and, and mentioned in this March meeting where they, they uh, uh, so this is we will take care of the Central Asia ourselves. So um, to what extent is there a cooperation uh, on how to handle uh, China? You mentioned avalanches, and then we have the tsunami coming from east, and uh, of course there are raw materials and so on. And yeah, those are my two questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think we wait for your question. You'll get it afterwards. Um, please. Well, I think on, um, I think corruption is interesting. Corruption because it's a uh, it's a very particular thing in this part of the world for a reason, which is that, and another thing we often forget, is that the independence didn't only mean the creation of new states, but the transition, of a, a complete change of an economic system from the planned economy of the Soviet period to the market economy, which meant privatization. And because, who, who does privatization? Well, the people who are in political power, which means that by definition in 1991, what happened is that when, when the economy was privatized, there was a fusion of political and economic power because the people who could decide how to privatize corporate state-owned corporations ensured that they were privatized in such a way that it benefited them and their friends and their families, etc. At that time, there were no real functioning state institutions. So this is very much a birth defect of the whole region, uh, which means that it's all the more difficult to disentangle. And that's why I think it's so interesting to see that uh, Special, as long as oil prices were high, I'm talking especially for countries like Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan, to some extent for Uzbekistan, which is not a major oil exporter, but a producer, um, this was not a big issue. You know, it was because you know if you are at the top of the leadership, even if you realize that you know all these barons around you are doing really crazy stuff, as long as there's a lot of money flowing in without any real work, you can allow that. And it's very difficult to challenge these people, right? Because after 25 years, they are very rich. Uh, and so, you know, if somebody is worth a billion dollars, it's not easy to throw them to take their assets. Uh, that's why the revolution in Georgia happened, because there was very little money in the country. It was much easier to get rid of some of these vested interests than it would have been in a place like Azerbaijan or Kazakhstan. But what happened after the, the, the collapse of the oil price three, four years ago is that the top leadership understood that the social contract had changed. Before, the social contract had been, we provide stability and we provide an increasing living standard and an eradication of poverty by the, through the intervention of the state. And you let us rule the country as we see it. That wasn't working anymore because the state lost the ability to deliver in the same way that it had been doing for so many years. And that meant that for the top leadership in uh, Kazakhstan, to some degree in Azerbaijan, which is a little bit less vertical, and definitely since the Mirzioyev came to power in Uzbekistan, there is a, from the top, an interest in fighting corruption. Because they understand that if you don't fight corruption, um, the very legitimacy of the system could be in doubt. And that's what, one of the parts where we talk about in the book about focusing our interest where we have an alignment between what we want to see happen and the interest of the local elites. Fighting corruption could be one of them. If, we, if you come to these leaders and say, we want to impose electoral democracy right now, they're not going to be very enthusiastic. But if you come to them and say, let's try to fight corruption and improve good governance and state efficiency, they would say, now we can talk. Because that is something where they actually do have interest. Now, many of their cabinet ministers may not have an interest in this. That's another issue with how to navigate that internally. But at the very top level, there is now uh, an interest. On handling China, I would say primarily that China so far has been, uh, is only gradually becoming something to handle. Uh, this is not really where countries in Southeast Asia are yet. Uh, for them, China has been a factor that balances the, the predominance of Russia and therefore a positive factor for Central Asia. That might change in the future, perhaps we could. <laughs>
No, I would only add on the issue of corruption, I would just add what is now happening in, in Uzbekistan. Uh, last year there was an adoption of new anti-corruption legislation and with uh, uh, implementing uh, legislation to that. And there is a drive from the very top against high level officials and uh, corruptive practices. People have been, who previously have had very important positions, have been brought to, uh, to the courts, have been condemned, and people uh, and uh, ton of money that has then been stolen or amassed over time has actually been repatriated to Uzbekistan. And that's done publicly uh, and very clearly, and uh, also part of the president who talks about fighting corruption. I think going after very prominent uh, high level persons sends a clear signal to society. How that will then, you know, change and develop over time, I don't know. Uh, in China, uh, I do not know, but I hope that when the leaders of the five Central Asian countries uh, come together and say that we can cooperate on all issues, there's nothing which is you know, not on the table. I hope that also that could include working with China and to be able to reap the benefits of the, the Belt and Road Initiative in a way that really benefits the countries and also the citizens and not making Central Asia to a transit point where goods pass through because it serves someone's interest in one area and then into another, but that it can be used for developing the economies. And for that, I think regional cooperation uh, is, is needed because five together is much stronger than one on one. And I believe that, that China is good at bilateral negotiations and tough such. And I think here regional cooperation is important. So. Thank you very much. Down to the question you had in the middle. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Pekas Abdul. Uh, I'm currently a student of political science in Stockholm University and I'm working with from Uzbekistan. Uh, so uh, my question is that Mazial, the president of the he was uh, on a visit to the White House uh, recently. So there was actually a new, some news on Russian media saying that uh, there are 5,000 ISIS soldiers already in Central Asia and wants to start a war and the Central Asia is the brink, brink of a civil war. Uh, and then we can see that like, the Russian attitude towards uh, the new policy of Uzbekistan to, to, to engage in international society. Uh, what do you think about uh, how Russia will behave when uh, Central Asian countries want to cooperate between each other and they want to integrate more into into international society. Uh, yes. Excellent question. Um, well, I think um, not only what you just mentioned, but if you watch Russian media, you will see that there was an article, I think three weeks ago, in the Zavisa magazine that talked about how Kazakhstan is destroying security in the Caspian Sea because it allowed the transit of American military uh, goods and transit services to Afghanistan. And this, according to this Russian newspaper, means automatically the creation of an American military base in the Caspian, which destroys the security of the region. So you can already see what is happening. Uh, I think it's, it's, very, it's fairly clear uh, that for eight years under President Obama, there was a, an approach in which the US would not take really any initiatives in Central Asia. Uh, and it implicitly um, did so in part because they were not very interested in Central Asia, but also because they didn't want to quote unquote irritate Russia. Um, for various reasons, that's history now, and we have seen in the past four months the visits both of President Kazakhstan to Washington and now of President Kazakhstan. And I think this, and there is a completely, there's still a, a low level, but there is a growing interest in the US administration now. Central Asia as Central Asia, not just as a road to something. Because the Obama period was only interesting within the context of Afghanistan. There was really no interest in Central Asia separate from Afghanistan. Now we see that this is beginning to happen. Uh, so we're all waiting for what will be the Russian reaction. Um, if I told you that if anybody knew what it was, <laughs> we would be lying. But I think it's, and I think the, re the leaders of the region very much understand this. After both presidents went to Washington, and I saw just yesterday, President Mirziaev called President Putin and talked to one another about his own initiatives to talk about what had happened during the Washington. Now, the, the answer to your question, I think you provided it yourself, which is that the, 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 the Russians 
have a very clear track record of not wanting Central Asian countries to coordinate with each other uh, without Russian supervision. This is, I mean, this is a country that officially declares that this is part of an exclusive, a privileged sphere of influence. Uh, this is the wording that President Medvedev then used after the war in Georgia. But, and he said, it includes the former Soviet Union, but not only. Uh, we don't know what the but not only means. Actually, we do, because in Thai, we see the Russian support for the Taliban in Afghanistan, for example. Uh, so I think, uh, we, and we've seen this before. We saw that before, before Russia, when Russia was ramping up military threats against Georgia, 2002, 2003, they were also talking about how Georgia was a home to 1,500 Taliban fighters and Azerbaijan was home to 2,000 Taliban fighters. I mean, we've seen this movie play before. Uh, so the question is really, what will other, what will the Central Asians do? Uh, what will other countries do? What can other countries do to, to this? But the main thing, I think, which is different today than 15 years ago, is that it was very easy for Russia to, uh, to, sub, to use subversive methods in Central Asian countries 15 years ago. Because these states were much weaker. Today, certainly in Uzbekistan, I think it is, I'm not really sure what the Russians can do. If they want to do something, they can use propaganda, they can say they can be unhappy. But what can they really do that would undermine the stability of Uzbekistan? I'm not sure. I think gradually, especially in Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, but also in Kazakhstan, even in Tajikistan, uh, we see how the Russian doors have been closed that the Russians would use in the past to, uh, to subvert the stability of these countries. Maybe they, have to, maybe they have to understand at some point that sticks are not enough. Maybe you actually have to have some carrots if you want to influence other countries. Thank you very much. Actually, you know, our time is up, but I think we have room for one more question, the last question. I think you were first here on the third row, please. And why don't we take your question at the same time after that? Hello, my name is Bjorn Sona, I'm a Russian historian for the geopolitical situation of Russia as an influence. So, we need to have the law taking place with the United States and Iran. Do you think any possibility could be that Iran will approach the Central Asian countries because they have the historical influence there, an influence there, and as a way out of all these difficulties and how that will affect the geopolitical situation in Turkey, let's say within the next five to ten years. Thank you. Thank you. And this question here in front. I'm Paul Gatabal, I'm an international correspondent. And I would like to ask you if you are comfortable with the title of your book, because you give me the idea that you were going to talk about China and the strategy to the region. But as a matter of fact, you're talking a different, total different point of view. So I would like to know if you are really comfortable with it, because when I was searching Amazon, I found I was looking for China's Silk Road, and I found your book. So I, 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 don't, I don't see anything. Which part of the name? Uh, because I, I just found Silk Road yeah. in the game, and because it says no game on the Silk Road. Yeah. So conceptually, if you are talking about a game, you are talking about somebody's maneuvering something. Okay. So, let me take that first. The, the, uh, the implicit rationale for the title is that a lot of people have been talking about the so-called great game uh, between different countries, between different powers, whether it be the United States, Russia, China, or others. Uh, similar to the you know, great game of the 19th century between the British Empire and British Raj, rather, and the Russian Empire over Afghanistan and Central Asia. You can read Peter Hopkirk's so, book, you know, that's, that's the title. Or, of course, going back to Kipling, yeah. and Kim and all this. Uh, the idea of a long game is exactly the opposite to a great game. Uh, if you look at the definition of a long game, it basically means that when you take a long-term approach to something and stably and patiently advance your objectives. That's the long game. Rather than a great game, what we're advocating for is the long game, which is a long-term uh, strategy to, to define your interests and advance them patiently. Now, for the use of the Silk Road, obviously, this is the territory of the old Silk Road. Now, obviously, a lot of people, we have to say in this week, that the child has many names. Uh, and similarly, the, you know, the, the Silk Road is appropriated by many people, and certainly the Chinese. But, you know, the, the ancient transportation routes that were centered on Central Asia were not only between Europe and China. 
They also involve the Asian subcontinent in a very significant extent. And I think over the past, in the future, what you will see obviously is the, uh, what we're seeing already is the realization of the uh, transportation corridors linking Europe and China. But the ones that link Europe to, to South Asia through Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, and India uh, are obviously going to happen as well. Because if in, as we put it in a paper we published three years ago, uh, you know, we did some statistics to show that the working age population of the Indian subcontinent in 30 or 40 years will be double that, which means that as an economic partner for Europe, it's much more important to China than you have to think today about the infrastructure that you need uh, in 30 years. Now, on the, um, on the Iran, on, on Iran I, I think the, 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 the you're, of course, absolutely right about the historical connection between Iran and, and Central Asia, but the reality is that modern Iran has been uh, facing the other way. It's been looking south. Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't have a lot of affinity. It has a cultural affinity with Tajikistan, and it's been a partner, but Iran doesn't have a natural attraction in Central Asia. It's certainly not in the, the current Iranian regime. If you ask our friends from Afghanistan, they will probably tell you what the Iranians are doing together with their Russian friends and supporting parts of the Taliban movement. Uh, this is not something that attracts a lot of appreciation in the region. Uh, so the, the, Iran is mainly focused on the south and what's happening in, the, in creating its sphere of influence from Yemen uh, all the way through uh, to, uh, to, to Lebanon and Syria. Uh, and Central Asia has not been a major part of that, and I don't think that that is going to change. With that, I think uh, our time is really up. I would like to thank you for, for coming and listening. And I, first of all, I'd like to ask you to thank you.